Thank you, Pastor Mike. Can you guys hear me? All right, good. Well, good morning. Like you heard, we are finishing our series titled Unguarded today. Say it with me. Say unguarded. Unguarded. Where we've been looking at the story of a guy in the Bible named Peter. We looked at some of the actions that he did, which were unguarded, leading up to the time when he would deny Jesus right before Jesus was arrested and then eventually crucified. In this series, we looked at the unguarded gift of Peter. We looked at the unguarded heart of Peter. We looked at the unguarded step of Peter. And today we're going to finish up the series with the unguarded. You're going to have to wait for it. (laughs) It needs a setup. I promise it will be worth the setup. So one time when I was a teenager here at the church, we were going to take a trip to a water park known as Mountain Creek. And it was a really hot summer this year, so we were all excited to go on this church trip. Not only was it a hot day, but you get to go to a water park with all your buddies from church. There's nothing like it. It's a field trip. It's exciting. We all know the feeling of going on a field trip. So I decided that I was going to ride in the car with Pastor Mike. He was my youth pastor at the time. And there was about six or seven of us in the car. We're all having a good time, we're making jokes on each other, we're laughing, we're driving through Pine Island, which is all black dirt, it's a beautiful location, and everything is going well on this trip until my pastor says something to everybody in the car. Now understand, he's not just my pastor, he was my youth pastor, my friend, and then he gonna say this on a church trip. This was very difficult for me in this moment, and I could already see it. People think, what did he do? Did he curse at you? We got to find a new church, honey. Relax. He didn't do anything crazy like that. Here is what happened, and I got to add one more thing. I was a pretty good Christian at this point. I would read my Bible every single month. That's 12 times a year. Like, I was killing the game, and all of a sudden, Pastor Mike drops this bomb on everybody in the car. He says, we have to do the cliff jump before we go on any other rides at the water park. Now, if you don't know what a cliff jump is, it is voluntarily, (laughs) voluntarily throwing yourself from a height that would kill you if it were not for water at the bottom. (laughs) And apparently, people enjoy this stuff. He says, we have to do the cliff jump. My natural response to this statement is, Pastor Mike, who is this person named we? (laughs) Yeah, and why do they have to do the cliff jump? Because me don't do no cliff jump. Nintendo Wii, you do whatever you want. For me, I do not throw myself off of any cliffs. That is scary. That can make anybody feel a little bit of fear. And I'd love to stand before you today on this pulpit and say, you know what? I faced my fears that day. I said, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I'm going to jump off of this cliff. That's not what happened. (laughs) Not at all. What happened was there's this thing called self-imposed peer pressure that got me to do it anyways. Self-imposed peer pressure is like, imagine this. Imagine we're all in church, and at the same time, every single person in the whole room just starts to take off their shoes, except for you. What are you going to do? You're going to be like, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I don't want to be the only one that doesn't do it. And that's how I felt in that moment. I don't want to be the only one in this group that doesn't do the cliff jump. So the next part of our story goes like this. We get to this cliff jump, and there's a line. We walk up this little path, and we're in line. So all the people that enjoy to throw themselves from heights that would kill them if it weren't for the water, they went first. They were having a blast racing to the front, and then the line starts to creep up and creep up, and it starts to get real. My heart begins to beat out of my chest like, oh, shoot. Like, this is about to happen. And then a few more people go, and I'm about fourth in line. 
And this is what I consider the point of no return. Say that with me. Say the point of no return. That's the point where it's like, all right, I can't go back anymore. There's too many people behind me, and I'm pretty close. I start to get a little more scared, like it's a life or death situation. I think about my imaginary wife and kids, and who's going to take care of them at this point? Who's going to tell them I got $10 so they can get a warm meal after I pass? Get into that mindset, and then I'm second in line now, and my heart is beating out of my chest. I'm like, all right, Josh. Here's what you're not going to do. You are not going to go up to the edge and look. Because the second I look over the edge, I knew I was done. A quick jump would have turned into a five-minute battle with Pastor Mike like, where are you going? Jump off the cliff. And I didn't want that. So I get into my head, and I think it was Ray Vaughn at the time. I said, all right, I'm going to look at Ray Vaughn, and I'm going to say to him, I'm going to jump. And then I'm just going to run and take off, and I'm going to jump. So I'm next in line, and I'm inching forward, and then the person in front of me jumps, and without even thinking, I go, Rayvon, I'm going to jump. And it's kind of like, we're at a cliff jump. What else would you do at a cliff jump, right? And I say, I'm going to jump, and then I just take off running step by step by step by step by step by step, and then I just fold my arms, and I jump. And everything in front of my eyes went blurry because you're falling so fast. I hit the cold water. It was uncomfortable. It took my breath away. Funny thing, I opened my eyes and I saw a light. Like in a movie when you die and you got to swim to the light. It just looked just like one of those movies. I swam to the surface. I got to the edge. And yes, you heard it right. I had completed the cliff jump. Hallelujah. I had done it. Something that I was afraid of, I finally had done it. Now, what's the point of my story today? My point is not that cliff jumping is ungodly, because I'm here, I survived, I made it. It's not that cliff jumping is impossible for me to do. It wasn't the fact that we should follow self-imposed peer pressure. That's not the point of my story. The reality of this story is that leading up to that day, I had put myself into a mental prison called fear. I had told myself I am unable to go cliff jumping because I am afraid of it. I had created a prison cell that was created for me and created by me. It was a mental prison that only I had the power to escape from. And today I want to ask you, have you ever been stuck in a prison where you were the one holding the key? Wow. Have you ever been in a prison that you put yourself in and only you had the power to escape from? There's a dialogue written by this guy named Plato. And there's this quote in it summarized, which I loved very much. It says this, mental incarceration is the worst type of prison because the prisoner is the one holding themselves captive. In a mental prison, we're keeping ourselves captive. Today, the title of my message is Unguarded Prisons. Unguarded Prisons. Say it with me. Say unguarded prisons. So the unguarded prison is the prison that we create for ourselves. And the unguarded prison is the prison that only we have the power to walk out of. It exists in our minds, and we are the ones who are holding the keys to said prisons. And we saw this in the story of Peter leading up to the moment when he would deny Jesus. That he didn't have a physical problem, but he had a problem in his heart and a problem in his mind. I don't want to take up too much time recounting the story, but I want to highlight some things that we saw. And it will all make sense when we get to the end. So remember these things. So leading up to the denial of Jesus and the eventual arrest of Jesus, we saw a few things in the story. We see in the book of Matthew that there was government and religious persecution on Jesus and on his followers, specifically from the Jews. 
We saw that this story took place during the Passover, which was a celebration of what God had done for the people of Israel. We see a little bit later in the story that Jesus tells his disciples, you're going to abandon me. And Jesus was quoting a scripture that the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would scatter, talking about his followers. And he says this to them, and Peter says, not I, Jesus. All these may deny you, but as for me, I will die for you. Fast forward a little bit in the story. We see that Peter, Peter is asked by Jesus to stay awake with him in the garden because he was having a hard time. And you know what they do? Peter, James, and John, they fall asleep. They're taking a nap. It says that Jesus struck Peter on the side, waking him up, and he says, bruh, you couldn't stay awake for one hour. It's like in one sentence, I'm going to die for you. Next sentence, can't even stay awake for one hour. I'm sure in this moment, Peter begins to realize or he realizes that he was unable to do what he said he would do. We see a little later in the story that Jesus gets arrested. He's bound up and he's led away. And Peter begins to follow at a distance. You see, Peter was not arrested in this story. Physically, he was completely free, but mentally he was in an unguarded prison that had him following at a distance. He put a space between himself and Jesus, not because of anything that Jesus had done, but because of the unguarded prison that he was living in. In the next part of the story, some servant girls begin to accuse Jesus of knowing Peter. And you might have met one of these servant girls before. You know those little kids when you're at the store trying to check out and they just stare at you? And they say, Mommy, why is his hairline like that? <laughs> Mommy, why is his glasses crooked? Mommy, his outfit don't match. Like, servant girl, mind your business. Go eat a piece of gum or something. These servant girls accuse him. They say, you know Jesus. And he says, no, I don't. They accuse him again, your accent betrays you, and then he gets mad. In Matthew 26, verse 74, it says this, that Peter actually began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to everybody listening, I don't know the man, Jesus. It then says, immediately, a rooster crowed. It then says that Peter remembered. Where do we remember things? In our mind. Unguarded prisons happen in the mind. He remembered the word that Jesus had said, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And then it says that Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. Now, I don't know what a bitter weep looks like, but I'm sure it's not pretty. I'm sure it's intense. I'm sure it might be kind of loud. Because inside of himself, Peter knows that he had failed to do what he said he could do. Once again, he's realizing he could not do the very thing he swore he would do. I'm sure in this moment he felt like he had failed Jesus. I'm sure he felt the shame of denying somebody that would never deny him. And it's in moments like these where we get low that we tend to build these unguarded prisons, these prisons in our mind. Maybe you felt this way before. You ever have one of those moments when you swore you never were going to do something again? This is it. I'm drawing a line in the sand. I made my Facebook post. I'm done with it. And then you do the exact thing that you swore you were never going to do. Only a few people have. It's not a fun feeling. It is not a fun feeling. And it's in those moments that we tend to build these prisons in our mind. We say things like, I swore I wasn't going to lose my temper. But who moved my pencil to the left side of my desk? You know it goes on the right side. I swore I was going to spend more time with the kids and then work called on the one day that I had for them. And I went in. I swore I was going to go to the gym, but here I am watching Netflix again. 
I swore I was going to keep this diet, but why would God place a Chick-fil-A right on the route that I'm going in? I need to give God a Polynesian sauce praise right now. Whatever these things may be, I think we all know the feeling of creating a prison in our mind, especially when we fail. And one level is, I feel like I failed. A lower level is, I am a failure. We could begin to go lower and lower and deeper into these prisons, into our heads. You say things like, well, I guess I'm always going to be this way. I guess I'm just a bad worker, a bad co-worker, a bad parent. I guess I'm just undisciplined. I guess I'm just an addict. Whatever mental prison you might put yourself in today, I think you might know the feeling that Peter felt. Like you're a letdown, like you're a failure. And if that's you here today, I came with an announcement to make. That if you're living in a mental prison because of a mistake that you made or something that happened in your past, I need you to know this today, that God is a God of second chances. God is a God of second chances. And if you're the person here today that says, gotcha, I already used my second, third, and fourth chance. Well, the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. So good luck trying to catch up with that or stay with that. But somebody say it. Say second chances. And it's one thing to talk about Peter getting a second chance. But what I love about God's word is we get to read it right in front of our eyes. So we're going to fast forward to later on in the story. This is in Acts chapter 12, which historians agree is sometime between 8 and 14 years after Jesus was crucified and left the earth. So there could have been a 14-year gap between this story and the story that we saw at the beginning. And I want us to compare the first story the second story, and look at the second chance that Peter gets. So in Acts chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. There is one similarity. In both stories, we see government persecution. It says that he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews to religious persecution... He proceeded to arrest Peter also. Three, Jesus got arrested in the last story. This was during the days of unleavened bread, also known as the Passover. Four, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people Five, Jesus was brought before the people and they chose a man named Barabbas over him. I wonder if Peter is walking through this story in his mind and kind of saying, I know how this story ends. Doesn't this end in me dying? But I'm so glad that God is a God of second chances. Somebody say second chances. In verse six, it says this. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was, he was what? Sleeping. There are six between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Now a lot has remained the same between the two stories. But here I think we begin to see a shifting of the storyline. Because in the first story, we saw that Peter was physically free, but he was mentally bound, right? Right? But in the next story that we're about to see, Peter is physically bound, yet mentally he's free. And it's amazing how this plays out. Let's read verse 7. It says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. Isn't it amazing how God can show up to even the darkest places of our life? How the light of God could go into the darkest areas, the prison cells we feel stuck in. It says that he struck Peter on the side and he woke him up. And then he said, quick, get up. 
and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. The chains fell off Peter's wrists. And this moment was critical to me as I was reading this story. Because we see that Peter's asleep, that he's in these chains, that he's held up, that he's bound, but something else happens this time around when he wakes up from his nap. Because in the first nap, Peter woke up with the realization that he wasn't able to do what he said he was going to do. But in the second nap, he woke up with the revelation that God is able to do what he could never do. I'm going to say that again. In the first nap, Peter woke up realizing, I failed. I couldn't do what I said I was going to do. In the second nap, when Peter had no way out of escape, he woke up with the realization that God was able to remove the chains that he could never remove in his own strength. And today you might be in here and you're struggling with this idea of chains. And you're using all your energy trying to break these chains off of you that are, you feel are holding you back. I need you to know something today. That if you're using all your energy trying to break these chains, you might be trying to break something that Jesus broke 2,000 years ago on the cross. Our freedom today is not found in our ability to do more. God, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to fast more. I'm going to do more. You cannot add on to the finished work of Jesus. You cannot add on to the finished work of Jesus. I remember when I was in college and we'd be taking a test and there would be something that would be said at the end. Pencils down. You know what pencils down means? It means if I see you even try to wiggle your arm, zero, zero, zero. Pencils down means we are finished. You know what Jesus did on the cross? He said, Satan, pencil down. <laughs> Satan, keys down. Because the work was finished. There is nothing we can do to add onto what Jesus has already done. And our freedom today is not found because of our strength, but our freedom is found in what God is able to do, the things that we can never do in our own strength. Let's not focus on our chains today. Let's not focus on the things that are negative, the things that don't look right. Because sometimes we can get so focused on the chains that we forget about the one who broke them. We can get so focused on our issues, we forget about the one who's the solution. We focus so much on our sickness and our disease that we forget the one who bore the sickness on his body. We can focus so much on the chaos that we forget about the Lord, our peace. So focused on the bills and the debt that we forget about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. And when we get into moments where we're focusing so much on what doesn't look right, I believe that we're living in an unguarded prison. That we're putting ourselves in a jail, in a bondage in our heads that only we have the power to walk out of. And if you're here today and you feel like you're stuck in one of those, I want to encourage you with the next part of this verse. Because there is a solution. In verse 8 it says this. Then the angel said to Peter, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. In verse 9, it says that Peter followed him out of the prison. Peter followed him out of the prison. So Pastor Josh, Jesus broke the chains so I can just sit down, right? There's nothing left for me to do, right? If Jesus completed the work, then I can just sit back and whatever happens, happens, right? Not quite. Because God removed the chains, but Peter still had to walk. God removed the chains. The thing that Peter couldn't do, God took care of. 
But Peter had legs and he had the ability to walk and he still had to walk out of that prison. The finished work of Jesus doesn't mean that we don't have to walk. It means that we walk knowing that victory is already ours. That is the finished work of Jesus. We walk in victory knowing that by the time we wake up from our sleep and we look at the light shining in front of us, we're going to look down and say, whoa, where's those chains? Who undid those chains? Who broke those chains? We walk in victory. We can walk by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. If you're here today and you feel like you're living in an unguarded prison, you feel like in your head or maybe in your heart, you've removed yourself from a situation or you feel like you're stuck in a situation, not because of the situation, but because of maybe you're afraid to make a change, you're afraid to move in a new direction, you're living in this prison, maybe it's out of comfort. It's more comfortable to remain in prison than to try to walk out. And you say, walking by faith is cool, but I think I'm just going to stand still. You're getting distracted by the idea of the unknown. You don't know what the change is going to look like. If that's you today, and you're having a hard time with this idea of walking by faith, I want to tell you a little story that happened. So there was this one time we were going to Mountain Creek, and there was this unguarded prison in front of me. And I was in line, and I was standing in that prison, and my heart was beating really hard. Pastor Mike had told me that we're all going to do the cliff jump. And on your ride to church today or on your ride through life, God told you, I need you to do the cliff jump. And you're scared. Your heart is beating because you don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a little idea. I need you to look to the person on your left and look to the person on your right. Do it. Look. Look at each other. Say, hey, girl. And I need you to look at your friend and tell your friend, I'm going to jump. Tell the other person, I'm going to jump. And I need you not to walk by faith because there's people in line waiting to jump as well. I need you to say, God, I'm going to do the thing that you've called me to do. Don't think about it. Just step by step by step by step by step by step by step. Run, cross your arms, hold on to the word and jump into what God is calling you to today. You need to jump into what God is calling you to do in this season. The jump. When you jump by faith and you're falling through the air, you can't see what's going on. Everything blurs together. It's uncomfortable. You might have to just do it scared. Faith is not the absence of fear. It's moving forward despite your fears. You might hit the water and it feels cold. And it might take your breath away to jump into a new season. And many times because it's uncomfortable to follow God, we say, God, are you sure? It's really uncomfortable. But you know what the cold water was to me? It was a reminder that I'm still alive. When I felt the cold water, I knew that I had survived the jump. And sometimes we need to thank God for the cold water and not just the hot tubs. Because if I try to jump into a hot tub, my leg would do this weird thing right now because they'd be broken. Or maybe I would have been dead trying to jump into a little hot tub trying to make that jump. I want you to know today, when you jump into the unknown, it might feel dark but I want you to do what Peter did. Wake up, open your eyes, and just move towards the light. Just swim towards the light. It's instinctive. There was not a single instinct in my body that told me not to swim to the light. And any animal that needs oxygen knows swim 
towards the light. Any land animal, because fish need oxygen and all that stuff too. <laughs> but any land animal that jumps into the water knows if I swim to the light, I can swim up. I saw a little um, documentary how they, they'll take, what was it? It was Marine Force Recon. And they do this exercise where they'll put a helicopter in water and they'll flip the helicopter, flip the helicopter. You know what they teach them? Look for the light. Look for the light. If you feel like you're in life and you're getting mixed up, I want to encourage you. Look for the light. Look forward to God. Look forward to God. It's like the scripture that talks about lifting my eyes into the hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. When we look to God in these moments where we step into the unknown, jumping in, out of these unguarded prisons, I want you to know there's a life that exists outside the prison you've been living in. There's a better and brighter day that exists outside of those prisons. Like, I, I got to go to the lazy river. Like, I got there. I got to chill and lay back and enjoy the sun. I didn't love the cliff jump, but there was a whole water park that I got to enjoy. And there's a whole life that we have to enjoy outside of the prisons that we live in. As the story goes on, it says that Herod was not happy that he went to the guards and he said, where is he? And when he couldn't find them, when they couldn't find them, they put the guards to death. We might need to put some things to death today. We might need to put some things to death today. There might be people that we're trying to please that are keeping us in an unguarded prison. We might need to walk away from that and take up a life-giving relationship. There might be some habits that we got to put to death today to take up that life, to walk in that victory that Christ has given for us. And today, this is my last point, last idea. If you're living in an unguarded prison, you are holding the key, and his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you that your presence would be felt in this moment. Lord, if this is just a nice message and no lives were changed, then what was the point? God, I thank you in this moment by the power of your Holy Spirit that lives would be changed in this moment that life trajectories would be changed in this moment. God, I thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding upon every person in this room. Jesus, I thank you today for laying your, down, your life down for us that we might walk in victory. I pray, Lord, that we would never forget the things you've done for us the battles that you've won for us, God. And I thank you today, Lord, that as we walk or run by faith, that we walk with the vic knowledge that victory is already ours. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. What a great job he did today, amen. So there's one part of this cliff jump story that he left out. Josh can't swim. Uh, he has 0% body fat. So like, have you ever seen a wishing well where you throw a penny in and it sinks right to the bottom? That's Josh. Uh, so beyond the fact of the fear of heights jumping off a cliff, he also knew he couldn't swim once he hit the water. Huh? I want to tell you today, you may feel in life like you have to make a decision that puts you on the edge of an abyss. That you maybe feel like you're standing on a cliff to make a decision. And, all, and the, the height scares you, but why, what might even scare you more is the depth of the water. You have to remember this. 
The water is deep at the bottom of a cliff so it can absorb your impact. If it was shallow at the bottom, you'd break your legs, break your spine, and die. <laughs> but the water's deep for your safety. And there's times that God's gonna call you out into deep water where you lose your footing, where you can't touch the bottom. And in, it's in those moments that he wants you to know that that's actually the safest place that you could be is when you're not in charge and you're not calling all the shots. He calls you out to a place. He's going to call you out. Peter had to walk out by faith into a new place of unknown. I want to offer that to you today, that the, 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 the biggest prison that you can find yourself in is the need for certainty. And in the world of uncertainty right now, you could be locked up so tight in a prison. Walk out of it. Walk out of it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you today for a word in season for us. We thank you that we can step out in, by faith into the world that you've called us to be a light in two. I thank you that this word is planted on good ground, reaping a harvest in due season. As we leave here today, Lord, we are blessed. We're blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you. Offering baskets are at the door on the way out.